Hello. In this video, we are going to finish up deriving the sigma orbitals for xenon tetrafluoride. We'll remind ourselves with a quick sketch of our molecule and the group orbitals on fluorine, which are here represented as s orbitals, but which we'll see from energy considerations. We will learn our p orbitals labeled as S1 through S4. We also know in the previous section that we were able to generate a reducible representation for the sigma bonding, this gamma sigma, and we found by reduction that it was a linear combination of three different irreducible representations, A1G, B1G, and EU. Since we have four group orbitals, we need to have four symmetry adapted linear combinations. While it looks like we only have three here, we recall that EU is a doubly degenerate representation. So this counts as two. Each of these is non-degenerate. So two plus one plus one indeed gives us a total of four. We would like to be able to visualize what these sigma orbitals on xenon tetrafluoride actually look like. So we need to construct a new table, but in this particular table, we need one column, one heading column for each and every symmetry operation in the group, not just for each class. So to help make this clearer, I've used a vertical line to separate each of the classes, but used a header for each of the individual symmetry operations. So for example, we have two C4s in the character table, and we have to put each of the two C4s as their own heading. They belong to the same class, so they're enclosed by vertical lines. There's only one C2, for example. There are two different C2 primes, two different C2 double primes, and so on. What we are going to do in this table is to see the effect of each symmetry operation of the group on a representative group orbital, S1. For the identity operation, S1 stays S1. That's what's the identity. For C4, the first C4 is rotating in the counterclockwise direction. So that takes S1 to S2. For the second, this is the clockwise rotation, C4 to the minus one, which gives us S4. For C2, we're rotating in the XY plane of the whiteboard, so that takes S1 all the way to S3. Recall that for the C2 prime is around either this axis, the X axis, or around the Y axis. In this case, for the first case, rotating around S1 takes us to S1. Rotating around the Y axis takes us S1 to S3. So we put those particular entries into our table. Our C2 double prime goes between the axes so around this axis takes S1 to S2, and around this particular axis takes S1 to S4, and that's why we have these two entries. The center of inversion for this planar molecule is actually the nucleus of xenon, so this takes S1 and S3, and we have our S3 entry here. For the S4s, recall that an improper rotation is simply a proper rotation followed by reflection in the perpendicular plane. And the plane here is the plane of the whiteboard. So for S4, it takes S1 to S2, and then it reflects, it stays S2. The other S4 is the clockwise rotation, so S1 to S4, followed by reflection, which leaves us as S4. Sigma H is the horizontal mirror. Recall that the high order rotation axis is a C4, which is perpendicular to the plane of the whiteboard. So the mirror plane, the uh, Horizontal mirror plane is the plane of the whiteboard, and that simply takes S1 and S1. Our vertical mirror is the XZ plane, in the first case, or the YZ plane. So for the XZ plane, it takes S1 and S1. For the YZ plane, it takes S1 and S3. For our dihedral mirrors, SD, it's either this particular plane or this particular plane. So in the first case, it takes S1 to S2. 
And then the second case, it takes S1 to S4. So that we've taken our S1 and figured out the effect of each and every symmetry operation of the group on that particular orbital. To generate the entire symmetry adaptive linear combination for the group orbitals, we have to go through each of the irreducible representations one by one. And in our table, the second row we're going to write down has the characters for each of the symmetry operations of the point group D4H for the relevant irreducible representation. For the irreducible representation A1G, all the characters happen to be a positive one. So that's why each entry in the table here is a one. Then we multiply row two times row one and add, add up all the results. So one times S1 is S1. One times S2, for example, and then we add all these together. And since everything is multiplied by one, it's pretty straightforward to write down these terms here. So let me do that. And if you add all these together by uh, combining like terms, you see that we end up with 4s1 plus 4s2 plus 4s3 plus 4s4. We can factor out a 4 and we get that this is equal to s1 plus s2 plus s3 plus s4. We are allowed to do that because if we multiply a solution to the Schrodinger equation by any constant, that result is also a solution of the Schrodinger equation. Since we can multiply by any number, we can effectively divide by any number, that's not zero, and we have a legitimate solution. If we want to make this even more precise, we can make use of the fact that we want to have a normalized wave function. So the appropriate normalization constant in this case is going to be one half. So our overall uh, function here is one half times S1 plus S2 plus S3 plus S4. And this is the symmetry adapted linear combination that corresponds to the irreducible representation A1G. Now we do the exact same process, but now for the irreducible representation B1G. And we notice that the characters in the character table for B1G for each of the symmetry operations are now not all equal to plus one. But we do the same process. We write it down in our table as our second row, and then we multiply entry by entry the second row times the first row and add, uh, add up all the terms. So we get S1 minus S2 minus S4 plus S3 and so on here. So we'll add these all together. And you realize we're going to get 4s1 minus 4s2 plus 4s3 minus 4s4. And we apply the same process that we did last time. We divide through by a constant, which gives us s1 minus s2 plus s3 plus s4. Sorry, minus s4. And then applying the normalization condition we get one half of S1 minus S2 plus S3 minus S4. And this is the symmetry adapted linear combination of orbitals on the fluorine atoms that correspond to the point group B1G. The last symmetry adapted linear combination that we need to find is the EU. So again, we're going to make a row in our table here. And then we write down the characters from the character table for the irreducible representation EU in the point group D4H. 
and we see that in this particular point group, we have quite a few of the characters which are equal to zero. So this is going to be very quick to multiply the second row times the first row and then add the entries together. So we get 2s1 minus 2s3. We have minus 2s3 plus 2s1. So here we have 4s1 minus 4s3. So we're going to perform the same procedure we did last time in that we divide through by 4 and we get S1 minus S3. The normalization constant in this case is going to be 1 over the square root of 2. So our orbital is 1 over the square root of 2. Now, we have an interesting challenge here because we know that AU is a doubly degenerate representation, which means there must be two symmetry adapted linear combinations that apply to this irreducible representation, but we've only found one of those. So we need to perform a technique that we've done before, particularly for the point groups C3V and D3H. And the trick is a two-step process. The first step is to apply the symmetry operation that caused the degeneracy in the first place. So what causes degeneracy is that we have a high order rotation axis that is three or greater. So if you have a C3, a C4, or a C5, that is why we have a degenerate representation in the first place. So in D4H, the high order rotation axis is a C4. It is the cause of the degeneracy in the first place. So we apply a C4 operation to this particular expression and see what we get. So, so this is a perfectly good combination already to find the other one. We now be going to apply a C4 operation. So S1 goes to S2. C4 of, of S3 takes S3 to S4, so it takes minus S3 to minus S4. So we keep the same coefficient. So now we have one of the square root of two S2 minus S4. Now there are two possibilities. When we do this operation onto the orbital, we can either get the other member of the degenerate pair, or we can get essentially just a relabeling of the first orbital. And we see here, S2 minus S4 is not simply a relabeling of S1 and S3. S1 and S3 are two distinct orbitals. S2 and S4 are distinct from S1 and S3. So in this process, unlike what we saw for C3V and D3H, performing the operation on the orbital did not just simply relabel it. It actually did right away give us the partner function, the other member of the degenerate pair. So the other member of the degenerate pair actually is going to be one of the square root of two, S2 minus S4, and the other member of that pair is the one of the square root of two, S1 minus S3. So now, what do these orbitals actually look like? We've derived algebraic expressions for the orbitals, but we want to be able to visualize them. So we saw for A1G, we had one over two times S1 plus S2 plus S3 plus S4. The important features here are that all of the S's have exactly the same sign. That tells us they are in the same phase as each other. And the fact that they have exactly the same coefficients of one. So that tells us that, that the, they contribute equally to the overall molecular orbital. So one way that we represent that is, if everything has the same phase, we draw as an open circle. So we can think of the open circle as being the positive phase on the fluorine atoms. I'm not going to put the S in there just to save some writing to make it clearer, but we know these positions are on the individual fluorine atoms. So if this is the combination, which atomic orbital on xenon has the right symmetry to interact with each of these group orbitals? And the only combination that works is an S on fluorine, uh, on xenon. So if xenon has a positive phase and all the orbitals on the fluorine have the same phase, then we have an overall bonding orbital here. So, so it's, we need the orbital, the S orbital on xenon to interact with the A1G combination on fluorine. And we get that from the algebraic expression. Next, we want to visualize the B1G combination, whose algebraic expression was one half of S1 minus S2 
plus S3 minus S4. So here we see that the coefficients have different signs. So S1 and S3 have a positive coefficient, whereas S2 and S4 have a negative coefficient. So the way we represent that visually is for S1 and S3, we're going to draw them as open circles. And then for S2 and S3, we're going to draw them as filled in circles. And this is just to show that they have phases opposite to each other. So next we need to find which atomic orbitals on xenon has the right symmetry to interact with this linear combination. So we need something that has a positive phase in this direction, in the x and minus x direction, but has a negative phase in this particular direction, in the y direction. And the only atomic orbital on xenon that has that particular symmetry is going to be a d orbital x squared minus y squared. Also notice that this particular orbital has a node here and a node here, so it has two nodes, whereas the A1G, I didn't write it at the time, has no nodes because it's all bonding in every possible direction. So this gives us the A1G and the B1G combinations. So all we have left are to be able to visualize what the EU uh, molecular orbitals look like. We notice for the first of the EU pair, we have S1 minus S3, so this tells us that S1 and S3 have opposite phases to each other. So we'll draw the first one as being a positive phase, and then S3 as being negative phase. So they're different coefficients, different signs, so it tells us that we have different phases of the linear adapted combinations. Similarly, for the second combination, S2 and S4 have different phases. So we'll put S2 as being a positive phase and S4 as being a negative phase. So these are the two um, EU group orbital combinations. Are there any atomic orbitals on xenon that have the proper symmetry to interact? And we notice that, well, to be a bonding orbital, we need to have a positive phase in this direction from xenon, whereas we have a negative phase in this direction. A purely well drawn, but we recognize that something with a negative phase in one direction, a positive phase 180 degrees away is going to be a p orbital. So this is going to be the orbital px because it's along the x-axis. Similarly, for this combination, if we have a positive phase in the y direction and a negative phase in the minus y direction, we have the py orbital. So we see that we have the two different EU combinations, one that combines with the uh, px orbital on xenon and one that interacts with the py orbital on xenon. These are the only four symmetry adapted linear combinations of orbitals on fluorine that have the right symmetry to interact with the uh, atomic orbitals on xenon. The last thing is to arrange these molecular orbitals in terms of energy. The A1G, where we had just an S orbital on xenon in the same phase as the atomic orbitals on fluorine had no nodes, so it was lowest in energy. For the, and this was interacting with the S orbital on xenon. For the EU combinations, we had a P orbital on the central xenon atom, and the molecular orbital had one node, so one node is higher in energy than no nodes. And then for the B1G combination, we had two nodes, and that interacted with a particular D orbital on xenon, the dx squared minus y squared. So from this, we can actually see the idea, at least as far as hybridization goes, that we get square planar hybridization when we have a D, we have an S, and remember we had two P orbitals, so we had this DSB2 hybridization. I thank you very much for your attention. As always, have a good one.